Sisters and brothers, welcome. Today, September 30th, is the feast day of Jerome, priest and monk. We give thanks to God for the tremendous contribution which he made in sharing the light of God's word. Let us pray. O Lord, O God of truth, your word is a lantern to our feet and a light upon our path. We give you thanks for your servant Jerome and those who, following in his steps, have labored to render the Holy Scripture in the language of the people. And we pray that your Holy Spirit will overshadow us as we read the written word and that Christ, the living word, will transform us according to your righteous will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue to pray for protection against natural disasters. Almighty God, Lord of heaven and earth, grant unto us your suppliant people protection against hurricane earthquake, volcano, tsunami, and other calamities, that in tranquility of weather we may rejoice in the comfort we ever desire and may always make right use of your bountiful goodness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now a reading from the second letter of Paul to Timothy, chapter 3, verse 14 to 17. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have known the sacred writings that are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching for reproof, for correction, and for the training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. 
the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, who was Jerome? Jerome was the foremost biblical scholar of the ancient church. His Latin translation of the Bible from the original Hebrew and Greek, known as the Vulgate version, along with his commentaries and homilies on biblical books, have made him a major intellectual force in the Western Church. Jerome died on this day in the year 420. I share with you the text of a letter that he wrote to a young priest in the year 394. I find this letter extremely instructive. Yes, it was written in 394, but his valuable advice to all of us who are engaged in ministry today, both young and old. Here is what Jerome wrote to that young priest. Read the Holy Scripture constantly. Indeed, never let the sacred volume be out of your hand. Learn what you have to teach. As Scripture itself says, have a firm grasp of the word that is trustworthy in accordance with the teaching so that you may be able both to preach with sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict it. Continue in the things that you have learned and that have been entrusted to you, knowing from whom you learned it, and be always ready to give an answer to anyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. Do not let your deeds contradict your words, lest, when you speak in church, someone may be saying to themselves, Why does not this practice, this man practice what he preaches? Look at the hypocrite. His stomach is bloated with rich food, and he stands here preaching to us about fasting. A thief might just as well accuse others of avarice. In a Christian priest, mouth, mind, and hand should all be in harmony. When you are teaching in church, try not to seek applause, but lamentation. Let the tears of your hearers be your glory. A presbyter's words ought to be seasoned by the reading of scripture. Do not declaim or rant, gabbling your words without rhyme or reason, but rather show yourself learned in deep things, versed in the mysteries of God. To let forth a stream of words in order to impress an uneducated audience is mark of conceit. The fact that you have a deep conviction will communicate to your hearers and become authoritative. I learned this from my own teacher, Gregory of Nazianzus. Certainly, there is nothing so cheap as deceiving an uneducated audience by sheer force of words. Such people admire what they are failing to understand. Many people are building churches nowadays with walls and pillars of glowing marble, ceilings glittering with gold, and altars entrusted with jewels, encrusted rather, with jewels. Yet, little thought is given to the selection of Christ's ministers. Let no one try to contradict me by reference to the ancient temple of the Jews with its altar, lamps, censers, dishes, cups, spoons, and the rest of its golden vessels. If such things enjoy the Lord's approval, it was because they corresponded to the time when the priests had to offer sacrifices 
and when the blood of sheep was redemptive for sins. They were merely figures pointing to a new order. But now, our Lord, by his own poverty, has consecrated the poverty of his house. Let us, therefore, think only of his cross and count worldly riches as refuse. Finally, would you know what sort of apparel the Lord require you to wear? Prudence, justice, moderation, courage. These are four virtues which should fill your horizon. Think of them as a four-horse team bearing you, Christ's charioteer, along at full speed to your goal. No necklace can be more precious than these. No gems could create a brighter galaxy. So let them be the decoration you bear and with which you clothe yourself, for they will protect you on every side. They are your defense and your glory. For each of these gems, God turns into a shield. Wow, that is powerful. And so, yes, we thank God for Jerome and all those who labored to make the Word of God accessible to us. Thank God for the Word which St. Paul gave Timothy. I recall my father telling me, the only book that is current is the Bible. It has instruction for every age, for every generation. I would like us to take note of this. Just as there is no such person as a Christian who does not pray, so too there is no such person as a Christian who does not read God's Word. The Bible is God's blueprint for living. Note St. Paul's instruction to Timothy. Continue in what you have learned and firmly believe, knowing whom you have learned it, from whom you have learned it, and how from childhood you have known the sacred writings that are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. The Bible contains all things necessary for salvation. What does all things necessary mean? It means that you do not have to go looking for salvation anywhere else. Among the stories in the Bible is a grand story. The grand story is this. God made us. Sin mars us. Jesus saves us, heaven awaits us. And never forget this, the Word of God is made flesh in Christ. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. So we read in St. John's Gospel, chapter 1 and verse 14, Belief in the Bible does not save us. We are saved by the blood of of the crucified Christ revealed in Scripture. He is the one who saves us. We do not worship the Bible. We worship the God revealed in the Bible. Knowledge of the Bible does not get us into the Kingdom of Heaven. God alone makes that decision. So it was that God in His great wisdom discovered that no written document could get the job done. And so He sent the living Word into our midst to show us the way. Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Thanks be to God.